Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Neil and Jordan podcast, the podcast where two comedians talk like experts on subjects they are not experts on. I have a show in Melbourne in one week by the time this podcast goes out on the February the 6th. So yeah, come yeah. along to that. We've got Blake Pavey, Annie Louie and Ashley Filzame. It's going to be a great show. The second half is all improv. We're bringing improv back, baby. You are bringing improv back. It's, that is a dead art that you resurrected. It's no longer just our reruns of Whose Line Is It Anyway. We are going to bring it back <laughs> better than ever and integrate it to the uh, digital space. So come see us if you're in Melbourne. We also have a Newcastle show uh, just announced March 20th, I believe it is. And from then on, it will hopefully be monthly as well. So the plan is to have a weekly Sydney show, uh, a monthly show in Melbourne, Newcastle, Wollongong, and then hopefully Brisbane too. Uh, and you know what, Adelaide and Perth, we'll probably do a tour at the end of the year or something like that. We don't know yet. It's all in the works, but that's the plan. You're making it go nationwide. Yeah, regularly as well. Yeah, I want to create a brand, a comedy show brand, not just my comedy show that I'm taking everywhere, but uh, this will have featured comedians. Uh, there'll be different games. Uh, it'll be the sort of show where people will want to come back because there's a lot of crowd work. There's a lot of improv. So, uh, yeah, you're not going to just uh, see the same material. So if you did come to the last Melbourne show, we'd love to see you again. So, yeah. And uh, you've got some shows on, don't you? Apparently so. I have my shows coming live in Adelaide uh, at some point in February on a show that I am scrambling towards finishing as we speak and going through long, long days of very finicky edit notes about uh, should they be wearing, a, should you have a Powerade in their hand or a Lycajay? Lycajay, Lycajay. Actually, I should just go back to Powerade. Sorry, I'm a bit bitter today. That was 14 hours. And that's another 14 hours tomorrow. Oof. Yeah, it's it's the worst part of the job is getting the slides together for the show. It sound like you're getting into a comedy mindset, you know? No, I'm not. It's so much further. It's exactly what we were talking about before. It's what you would imagine being a writer for a show in the 90s must have been like. Right, torturous. Slave, torturous. Slave mentality. Lots of coffee. Staring at paper so long that you actually develop bad eyes and need glasses. Okay. Well. That's me. So, your life sounds really fun. Um, I like yeah, the look, fact that it's live and spontaneous as There's well. work involved, but uh, I think I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not enduring 14-hour days wondering whether to, to put Powerade or Gatorade on stage. No. You Does, just is go that with really Powerade a detail that's going to determine the, uh, the hilarity of the show? And you know what? We came to that conclusion at the end and said, Powerade, let's move on. I will add this, though. That was after a 25-minute debate. Okay. Well, everyone who sees uh, Jordan's <laughs> new show, can you please inform us whether uh, at whatever point that the Powerade bottle appears in the show, tell us if that was the defining moment of the show. Yeah. And whether it was worth a 25-minute yeah. <laughs> discussion and a 14-hour debate or whatever the fuck you went through with your team today. Seems Just a bit off. superfluous to me, but uh, hey- Look, uh, you don't understand art, Neil. No, I'm not. I'm clearly, uh, I don't have a respect for the art and the craft that you do. <laughs> Man, I am, a, I am a really big fan of this idea of yours to kind of turn, you know, like an old school 70s variety show, I suppose. Yeah. Bringing that back. Yeah. That's a good vibe, actually, that we're going for. Just a bit of a variety show, a bit of roasts. Bit of bit of line games in there. It's all uh, oh off the cuff. Who knows what's going to happen? Yes, it's all, it's all a bit wild and spontaneous. Yes, and uh, you will probably be featured in one of our clips. So uh, yes, Melbourne February sixth, uh, Newcastle March twentieth. More shows along the east coast definitely announced soon. Likely shows in uh, uh, Perth and Adelaide announced soon as well. And uh, that's it. The rest of Australia doesn't exist. So sorry. Fair. Uh, and this podcast is, of course, sponsored by Crush Organic CBD Oil. Go to crushorganics.com. That's Crush with a K. Use the code NEIL for 40% off. They've got a huge range of CBD oil products. Everyone's feeling it now with COVID, uh, decimating hospitality and events and every industry. So uh, take the edge off. Relax in a reasonably healthy way, especially compared to uh, drinking 10 beers when you come home. So uh, I think... You should have a few drops of CBD oil instead. If you haven't used it before, take the recommended dosage. Start off with two or three drops. Wait a few hours. See how you feel. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Crushorganics.com. Use the code NEIL for 40% off. All right. That's all the housekeeping done. How are you? Yes, it is. I'm very good. 
I have some pieces of housekeeping that I have to address. The first one is very glad to see all the comments nagging Neil to start up a Twitch stream for NRL commentary. Keep that going. Yeah, I know it's in the works. I'm talking to a mate of mine. Yes! Who we uh, we will often watch Super Saturday and have a few beers. So uh, we're probably just going to do that Kings. from my apartment now. And I- I'm very glad to hear it because it is okay. a hidden talent of yours. Well, we'll see. Remains to be fair. <laughs> Bring it back. What was it again? What was your name as a fourteen-year-old doing your fantasy football? I was. It was probably still Cog Money or something like that. Cog Money. Oh, it was just Cog, I think. Okay, bringing back Cog. Uh, the Cog. Cogs are footy tips. Yeah, Cogs footy tips has to be done. So glad to hear that everybody was on board with that because I'm always saying this to any kids that are interested in getting into the fine art that is standing up comedy the one big piece of advice that i would give you is if you're passionate about a subject you talk about that you don't think you don't go to open mic nights and look at all these losers coming up and saying oh my girlfriend hates me the internet's a wild place just no they're all copying each other find something that you really like and you bring something to it and you can really sense it when neil is talking about it that's why i wanted to actually really point it out as like a wider educational point is neil loves the game and as a result he has very specific information about it and he can bring it to life in real time it's the greatest game of all mate i think so too i really do like i don't Follow any sport at all because I think it's all shit. But if I was going to follow anything, it would be the NRL. Come on. I'm sure there'd be a lot of Labor voters who follow the NRL. I think there'd be a lot of Clive Palmer voters that follow the NRL. (laughs) Former disgruntled Labor voters who think, oh, it's gotten too woke. There are a lot of those guys. (laughs) Whoever's the most negative is who they're going to vote for. As we pointed out, first great observation of it, that there's not a more bitchy, whiny audience. I saw your mates uh, on a poster here. They're, they're doing a, a by-election here in Strathfield. Uh, where I live. I'm not sure if it's a state by-election or a federal. Are you aware of that, if it's a state or a federal by-election that they're doing here for a senator? No. Well, uh, I saw a poster of, uh, I didn't know this, Aussie Kozak is running. <laughs> yeah, you just found out about that, huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, know. That's that. been in the works. Oh, okay. That's your version of starting okay. up the Twitch in okay. for him. Yes, he's going to move from uh, getting arrested in zones to making the laws. Hmm. I have to <laughs> check out his policies. I would really like to know what that man's policies are. I, I don't know enough. You know what? I think his policies would not Rush be. Rush is awesome. To- <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Abolish the New South Wales police and uh, bring in, like, the Russian guard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think his policies would be too dissimilar to Black Lives Matter. It would probably be defund the police. Yeah, he'd be, oh, he'd be on board with that. He the would police. love that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hates the police, loves the Red Army. I'll tell you this, it's, it's a bold platform to stand on and no one else is. So, I guess let's see how popular the movement is. <laughs> yeah, man. This is a swing seat. You know, they've been, they've been campaigning here a lot. Um, what was it? Albo was here a few weeks ago and uh, Dom Perrottet was here. Did a whole press conference. I was working out at the outdoor gym right in front of him. He clearly had some SAS guards around him. Well, Perrottet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perrottet. There's a whole bunch of media personalities there. He's a very tall man. Oh, yeah. Ve- Huge. He's, he's very tall. Very yeah. skinny. But mm-hmm. uh, a tall, tall man, and uh, I've been uh, I've been handed a few pamphlets, both from uh, Liberal and Labor. I, got, I, I like the Labor, you know, the marketing. It's good. And what is because it? Because this is a very Asian seat, and, and it's just got a, a picture of the of the person who's running uh, with kids, and it's all about education. <laughs> it's like we support hard work and education. We want to empower you. To educate your kids so you can make something of your life. It's like, mm-hmm. that's how you win over Chinese and, 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 you know what, most immigrant voters. Oh, for Don't sure. Don't talk about, you know, any anything else. Don't talk about how they're victims. Just be like, this is how your kids are going to become doctors. <laughs> it's, it's a winning strategy. Work for me. I don't need to read anything else. I'm like, yeah, all right. That's good. You could even go more specific. <laughs> don't you reckon this? 30% more selective schools. You'd win. 
But doesn't that sully what a selective school is all about? I, well, you know more about really this area a than I do. School? You need, you need a, they, they need to still be selective. Okay, what about this? Eliminating any half selective schools. You know those okay. ones that have the area kids as yeah, well? Yeah, those are shit. You're gone. Yeah, yeah <laughs> those are pointless. <laughs> There's a one selective class and then they just get subsumed into the like a local area culture anyway. Mixed around by year eight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no it's enough not. of that. You want to be a big fish in a, in a small pond but not too big a fish. Yeah, then you get bo- yeah, then the tall poppy syndrome hits you. That's all they want because they want to hot house their kids. All right, so it is. We're closing down every selective school except James Roos. Yeah, <laughs> and all your kids win. will get into free tutoring. That's how you win this. If they want to get have this seat in the bag, free tutoring, <laughs> and um, you know, no taxes if you own a restaurant. Done. Oh my God. <laughs> This is a way you to- you have solved the puzzle. They are they're campaigning hard in some of these marginal Sydney seats, man. Like well, what this, are the Liberals uh, promising? Tax I, cuts on small business. Well, so- yeah, I saw the uh, pamphlet for the Liberal. Uh, for, there was a local election here. I actually couldn't vote because I forgot, and then the lines <laughs> were too long, and then I so I paid the fucking fine. <laughs> but um, the uh, campaign poster, I couldn't get. This is so superficial, but like the guys. Who were on the post on the pamphlet? I was like, these I just don't. Tr- these guys look like very creepy used car salesmen. They always do. And I don't, uh, that's such a superficial, uh, you know, reason for my vote. But uh, I didn't even see the Labor pamphlet. But I was like, look, I, I've hung out with Jordan enough. I'll probably. <laughs> I think that's good enough. Chuck on you. <laughs> I, I don't trust these guys on the pamphlet. <laughs> I think your judgment is correct, especially because you're talking about local government. It is going to be the lowest of the low going for that. It is the people that do not have the political savvy to get into state and federal politics. They don't have the gumption. They don't have the intelligence. What they do have is a bunch of DAs that they want approved, and that's the way to get it done. Yeah, I don't know a single person who uh, has ever worked in a local council or a local government, but I can't imagine they'd be of a- It's not a good talent pool. Notable ilk. It, what, what, the ones that do, that are good in local council don't want to stay in local council. They just want it because it's an easy way to get some kind of uh, sure. civic experience under your belt. Yeah. I have to say it's about 20% of them. And- I really do. You know, if you really want to be corrupt- and walk away with uh, a cool couple of million, mm. local council's probably the way to do it because, uh, you know, the media doesn't have eyes on you. No. Except you. I like the videos yeah, where you go up to a random, a random councillor in like a southwest Sydney seat and then now all of Australia knows who this person is. Even more niche than a current affair. <laughs> it's so niche. Here is this one guy that approved a building that should not have been approved. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest villain in the country. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Keep up the great work. I mean, yeah, it probably could have gone through a fair protocol, but the facts of the matter is they are related. So, you know, you're going to have to make up your own mind. Exposed. <laughs> how, how many votes do you think UAP is going to siphon from? Do you think they'll siphon more from? Well, okay, because they're ultimately going to preference the Liberals, right? Mm, mm. So even if they do siphon votes from the Liberals, it's going to end up back with them anyway. Yeah. Uh, so they're then going to essentially uh, hurt Labor more. Yep. Okay. How? That's m- the point. You know, because uh, polls, you just don't trust polls anymore. How many votes do you think they're reasonably going to get in just your average Australian electorate? Do you think they're going to? creep up to 10, 15% of votes, or do you think that's unreasonable? How, how, what do you, what's your prediction? Look, my prediction, and disregard immediately because I've been wrong about every election, but you look at the polls in 2019 and it's very easy because of all the headlines to believe, oh, my God, miracle election, Scott Morrison turns it around at the last minute. But you look at the polls and they're very clearly trending back to about a 50-50 split. Okay. And there's always like a 3% margin of error. It's the same thing as Trump. It's just like, oh, it was a miracle turnaround. But really, the polls were kind of like that, you know. When you look at Albo's polls, it's like- that, the complete opposite way around. The press isn't obviously admitting it, although they have turned on them massively. 
So I sense that there's a conspiracy happening there, but this was the um, prediction that I heard from insiders as well is that Murdoch was thinking of changing his tune this time around. Uh, I don't know why, but that was all the uh, gossip around Canberra. Is it because Labor have uh, edged slightly rightward? You know, they've uh, mellowed out in some of the uh, more... uh Oh, yeah, they've promised everything that uh, – they've, they've proven that they're not going to be antagonistic towards Murdoch's wishes. So, and so, as a result, for the fairest, he doesn't really care anymore. Okay, so they've rescinded things like the the uh, tax increase for higher income earners and the, uh, the uh, they were going to look at negative gearing and try and um, – limit that to a certain amount of houses and things like that. They've taken away some of those policies, right? Oh, yeah, that ship has sailed. And for everybody that says, oh, sellouts, what can you do from opposition, right? It's the same thing as always, only the, the, the impotent to pure, as Gough Whitlam once said. You have to get into government and that is, and it's a terrible, terrible tragedy, but housing is the Liberal Party's equivalent of Labor's Medicare. You can't touch housing because too many people are in on the Ponzi scheme now and it's too easy to run a scare campaign on it, which is a massive tragedy for our generation, but one we must bear. It is not going to change. Oh, share houses forever, bro. <laughs> yeah. Just, well, uh, Triple J, uh, Honest 100s in the uh, share house. Wiggles, number one. Have oh, the boys crazy. around. Yeah, the, yeah, it was so fucking sick, hey, <laughs> that, the Wiggles. Like, I fully thought, like, first I was like, that's lame. Then I was like, nah, it's fucking sick, eh? <laughs> oh, fucking nostalgia, eh? Yeah, yeah. Had a few craft beers. It's beer, not a bad but, tune either. Craft beffies with the boys. <laughs> we, we were, like, smashing the billy by that time of the day. Eh? <laughs> yeah, nah, change of the day, eh? Yeah, yeah nah, eh? <laughs> <laughs> what do you, re- what do you, okay, what's your verdict? Oh. Change of the date or not? Me? Yeah. Oh, I'm very, very vocal on that. Mine's been exactly oh, yeah, the same are. the whole time. <laughs> it's been exactly the same. I just think it's pathetic. I think it's the definition of a culture war. It doesn't change anything. And I think that it's just an extremely divisive tool uh, designed basically as just one of those wedge things that really you, you, you can. And, and as, like it, straight into your territory, Neil, classic virtue signal. It's just right. everyone who I know in my life that sucks is extremely vocal about that and it's just like no pride in genocide on the day and everything, right? Anyone that I know that is, and I'm even talking about Indigenous people here as well, they're not fussed about it. They have bigger things going on in their life. It's exactly what you're talking about. It's these totemic issues that people like to put around because it just kind of inflames their narcissism and gives them, they, they get that feeling of being a good person without actually having to do anything. Hmm, hmm. Mind yeah, you, I mean, when you're a uh, non-white second-generation immigrant, you really don't. I don't care. It feels like, okay, woke white Australians and Indigenous people are arguing with Bogan Australians over which day they can get drunk on. And, and here's the I other thing. I do it's not n- care what the day is because I'm going to be working that day. Same thing. Uh, that day means nothing to me, yep. so I do not give a fuck. I'm working on that day too, but I will say this. Uh, the polling a few years back and then they stopped doing it was that the vast majority of Indigenous people were kind of just like, don't care. Either don't care or feel good about it. Whereas it was about 30%, I think, that were just like, I feel bad about it. And then they stopped. They stopped doing the polling after that. And that was after their big push where all of a sudden all the papers, this is the thing, this push has been in small circles since like the 30s. No, not the 30s, like the 70s or whatever. All of these papers were just constantly pushing, Gary, Australia Day, Australia Day. And then as soon as it was trendy, like on a dime, I remember it. It was the same push as Hillary Clinton, 2016. All of a sudden, the exact same papers that were saying, Who, which celebrities are doing Australia Day? Watch your Australia Day look just instantly. You're in genocide. You should feel really bad about yourself. The, the, you know, it was coordinated, the whole thing. Mm. But yeah. the thing is, like, it's, it's, I go to, uh, I remember being in Lithgow. There's a big indigenous population there. Australia Day, what were they all doing? Out there on the dam like everyone else having a swim and a barbecue. I wonder if that has changed. It has been six years since uh, since 2016. It feels like we're still existing in that kind of a, amidst that culture war. But uh, I wonder if they do that polling today 
uh, whether that has changed. There's something to be said about symbolic gestures. I always thought they were uh, pointless. And uh, I always wondered when people would express the sentiment, say, always was, always will be, you know, you're existing on stolen land. Now, uh, okay, historically, if we look through what occurred through the lens of today's morality, of course, that was atrocious. The question then is, okay, how can we redeem that by doing something today? And yes, of course, we can uh, have... a welfare schemes and we can be supportive and we can even provide certain symbolic gestures which to a lot of people may not mean much but i think i have realized this is meaningful to others from what i can gather on social media however i would hear a phrase like uh you know stolen land always was always will be i'm like okay what are the practical implications even though that is maybe a symbolic sentiment right now what does that mean how does that look in 10 to 15 years time are people going to be giving back property and land because that's what i was in the back of my mind i'm like that's a worrying thing for me but i think i've since realized no most people just want the symbolic gesture and want to want people to just acknowledge that certain atrocities happened but i can't see people actually one day saying hey no look that's mine i want it back of course Because that's what I was initially very worried about, which made me very anti the whole thing. But I think I've realised, and, and I'm ju- purely judging this from, like, the, the Indigenous people I'm friends with on Facebook who were celebrating the Hottest 100 Day and, like, very happy that they did an acknowledgement of country. And I don't think they're going to come and one day be like, yeah, no, that's my house now because it's my land. But that's when I hear the sentiment, you know, stolen land, my land, that's what I was actually initially very afraid of. But I think uh, I, 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 through, I see everything through this paradigm now. I think this is a negotiator and a builder thing. You know, I think practically and, and sort of logistically about these sorts of things. I think a lot of people just want the certain, a certain emotional sentiment to be fulfilled or, or a void off of that to be fulfilled. And if that's the case, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm indifferent. I don't really have a horse. In, I, I think most. I saw a, a sketch uh, last year. It was this Islander guy who was um, saying Islanders on Australia Day, and it's just so applicable. It was, you know, basically white people and indigenous people arguing, and then he's like, "Oh, Maddie, nice barbecue," and then it's just like that's I don't, I don't care. <laughs> and most. Uh, well, that was again the poll. The and vast third majority of Australians do not care. don't. Yeah, it, most Australians don't care. I was actually wondering if you wanted to transition into a conversation about uh, the future cultural makeup of Australia because as far as I'm aware, the largest immigrant groups into this country right now are uh, Indian and Chinese and it is uh, estimated that by 2050, that's not that long away, we will be in our mid-50s. Actually, you might be 60. Mm -hmm. And the majority of Australia or a plurali- plurality of Australians will be Eurasian. So it will not be a white what, majority country. What's Eurasian qualify as? I All think the offspring will be Eurasian. Yeah, that was that was what I was not entirely sure about. Fuck yeah, what but a I'm, hot country. I'm fairly sure that it's a combination of mixed Asian or just Asian. I think that's what they mean. Because if they follow the current trends of uh, immigration in intake... And the growth trends as well, and is assuming that growth percentage increases at the same rate, then they're estimating that by 2050. And then they take into account, I'm sure they take into account birth rates and, and whatnot, but by uh, 2050, which seems sooner than I, than I anticipated. But regardless, it's likely that in our lifetime, there'll be a large portion of Australians that are either one or two generations removed from a Southeast Asian background. And how South much? East Asian. Well, South or Southeast Asian. Uh huh. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming primarily from the subcontinent or uh, China, South Korea, Japan, um, etc. And that's not that far away. No, it is not. And I, I, I thought it'd be interesting to uh, just to extrapolate from that and unpack what that might mean for the culture of the country and also for the politics of the country because. How do you imagine that will affect? Because, I, look, first of all, 
This is something you'd be able to speak at length about. How many new immigrants come here and are passionate about the labor movement in Australia? Zero. Yeah, exactly. So how many decades does that movement even have left? That's a good question. And I don't think many, as soon as you said that, that was the first thought I had, which is I think that in the future, Australia will be extremely productive and have a terrible work-life balance, which is what everybody, envy of the world now. <laughs> opposite every corporate, of what it is now. <laughs> exact opposite. Exact opposite. <laughs> in fact, you can already see the trends as we speak because we are increasing in productivity year on year. Are we? I've heard mixed things about that. Uh, I've heard our uh, productivity. Is, didn't, isn't that the whole reason they did the productivity commission or was that all a ruse to pay their mates? Well, I don't even know because I, it's been a while since I've like, I don't even know anything about the Productivity Commission, but I remember looking at the graph and the graph was just and workers' oh, okay. wages were. Yeah. Okay. Which is Asia. That's Asia in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that is Japan. Well, it's, the, it's the world. It's the world. Where is, it, is there a country where uh, wages are rising on par with uh, wealth? And productivity. I think we all know where it'd be if it was. Scandinavia. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Uh, but I'm not really sure about the rest of the world. I do know that that's the case there. I think that that's the whole point is that you're right. They're not going to uh, care at all about their workers' rights. And I think that this is something especially that I've noticed dating an immigrant as well is – they have a mentality. She's different because she went to our schools and everything. But the parents, obviously, because they came with nothing but the sh shirts on their back, all they do in their life is work. They take a day off on Christmas. So, they work 364 days a week. And a job that is crap as well. Like being a baker must suck. You get up at 3 a.m. You have to bake everything fresh that day. Mm -hmm. So, that's mm -hmm. hours and hours of work before you, the day even begins. And then you're there until 5 or 6 p.m. You get home. You have to be in bed by like 8.30, you know? Do you think that's a product of a, a culture unique to Asian countries or do you think it's due to the economic conditions of those countries? So, I'm sure if you go back to the industrial revolution in the West, there were people in factories and mines working 12, 14 hour days without having days off and living in squalid conditions. But then slowly over time, as the countries prospered economically, they were able to uh, fight for better workers' rights and uh, uh, share the resources around. And then uh, workers gained a certain consciousness to be able to fight for that. And then sometimes that actually tips over into entitlement and maybe immigrants coming over here look at some of the things that, say, na native Australian workers are asking for and think, oh, man, they're greedy. But how much of that is it just the the Asian work ethic per se and, and how much of it is just due to the conditions of those countries? Because in those countries, there's no welfare, there's no, there's no safety net, virtually none. I know in India there's not there's, I don't think there's even a pension. I think if you are a if you're in the government you get some very small pension but it's nothing compared to western countries let alone Australia. So as a result you sort of just have to adopt a mentality of uh just that extremely assiduous uh mentality. True. Having said that, uh, Africa, South America, very poor continents, poorer than Asia at this point, surely, don't have the same work that's, ethic. That's true. That's it's true. purely an Asian slash South Asian thing. And actually, you know what? I don't know about India, but when I was in Pakistan, you can't say that that was an especially productive country. They kind of just, you, you can see it. Everybody just sits around all day drinking small coffees and shit. Yeah, India's it's not exactly- It's not that no. when you go to China. It's not yeah. that when you go to South Korea. Yeah, it, it, no, there's, there is a marked difference there. Uh, India, it's not, there are a lot of lazy Indians. We'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what else? The one thing that does give me a little bit of hope, but I could be wrong about it, is that- it's something that I've just noticed a lot, which is that once a country is set, 
it kind of takes those values forever. The thing that made me really notice it is when I went to Turkmenistan, we went to an ancient Parthian city and there was a recreation of one of the Parthian kings on a horse, one of the statues that was there, on a horse with his sword in the air being like, yeah, you know? You fast forward, what, 2,000 years? The president of Turkmenistan is in a golden statue with, you know, sword in hand being like, yeah. Now, doesn't that just say everything? That once a system is set in place, it doesn't fucking move. That is the one alternate thing that I would say, which is that in Australia, we were set up by tradies. And they were all of the, because when they set up here, they realized convicts can't do shit. And then so a lot of skilled labor started migrating from Britain. They were the ones that really built Australia. And they realized that the governors were a bit cooler than aristocrats. And, you know, you could form unions here. And it was, they had the power to do it because they were so necessary. And so we used to be known as the workers' paradise. And I suppose in this extremely hyper-competitive planet, we still are known as the workers' paradise because if you are in a corporate world and you have those exchange programs with your other tentacle companies anywhere, you can't get a position in Australia. It, you, you have to fight tooth and nail for that. But you want to go anywhere from Australia to anywhere else in the world, be my guest. You can. But they all want to come here. They want to work in our corporate environment, despite the fact that my girlfriend worked in it. It's not like they're slacking off. It's just that you are worked to the bone everywhere else. Yeah. You know? And not the case in the US, not the case anywhere else. So, I think that that might be the one thing that might morph it. But here's the other alternative to that. If the predominant population is not Australian, they're first generation- and the whole thing is that no matter how much you try and assimilate into a country, like, and, I, and again, I don't blame them because they had to come here and then they had to instantly work and find a way to make money and raise three kids. But you go into my girlfriend's house, it's still Vietnam in there. Her grandma bashes crabs on the floor. You yeah. can't even get her to put it on the kitchen sink. She's not going to do it. It's there. Well, it's still Vietnam in there. Well, there's a, a multitude of factors that contribute to the, uh, I suppose, the lack of uh, integration. I think a policy of multiculturalism, <coughs> for as much as I'm in favour of that, <coughs> clearly, uh, has uh, allowed certain migrant communities to maintain their native culture. But I can only imagine with uh, access to the internet, if they can still consume media from the homeland and live in a uh, area where there's a, a larger portion of their particular diaspora, why would they integrate? Because I can tell you this much, for a lot of immigrants who come to Australia, basically they see Australians as just all bogans, whereas Aussies see bogans as a certain subset of Australians. Mm. But the immigrants just see all white Australians, they, they, oh, my God, they drink so much. And right, never work. Right, like, that's slack that's, off. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They're right. That's, well, that's the that's how they see it. Yeah, and uh, I wonder how that will play into. Uh, well, first of all, culturally, you're, you're looking at people who are far more socially conservative. I wonder how much. Uh, maybe we've reached the height of of even just LGBT acceptance. We we could have. I mean, if there's still if, if there's a continued uh, flow of. Um, Southeast Asian, particularly Muslim immigration, I think even second and third generation, they're not as, it's not as though they're, you know, Sharia law and saying you're going to hell, but they're not going to be as open and, and brazenly accepting of uh, the LGBT community. I think, I think you saw that with that one, I know this is just purely anecdotal, but that one case in the UK where there were um, Islamic activists who were, uh, getting quite up close and personal to a Labour MP saying, we do not want LGBT uh, ideas taught to our children. Like they, they were very passionate about it. Yeah. They were, they were borderline protesting against her. And you said a few podcasts ago that uh, a lot of the South West Sydney say, what the fuck, where am I pointing to here? Yeah, that's, uh, that's Sydney. <laughs> that, that basically is. Southwest. Am I right? That basically yeah. is. <laughs> um, 
Uh, no, turning, you're not wrong either. Well, they're turning to the liberals, even though a lot of them are working class and would probably benefit economically from a Labor government. But one, they have a mentality similar to a lot of, uh, I think, a... Uh, poor Americans that say, no, I won't, I'm going to make it one day and I want to be able to work hard and make it, not have my taxes taken away. I Look, that's obviously a very simplistic view, but there is that sort of aspirational mentality and even if it may have an immediate economic benefit to vote for a Labour government, I wonder if they think that's cheating, if you will, and, and the reason they even came to the West because they want a more neoliberal society, but also... A lot of those communities prioritize culture over um, economic concerns. So uh, regardless of the uh, economic policies of the two major parties, they might see one that says, uh, yeah, you're LGBT friendly or, or, you know, say something that, that their values may not align with, whereas the other one will be maybe not openly Christian, but they'll know, okay, there's a large Christian contingent within this party, which... I mean, very different to Islam. They fought <laughs> many wars <laughs> over that. But then, in, in this day and age, they probably have much more in common, the Christian and the Muslim community, than with, say, the broader secular community. Absolutely. And People so, of faith. Yeah. People th- of faith, they'll stick together. They will. And and I wonder how much that will play into the uh, voting patterns. And you, you're seeing that in America as well. A lot of Latinos are turning, and they're probably, the, they're one of the poorest groups in, in America. And there, a lot of them are voting Republican, and I can't help but feel uh, a, a large reason for that is that they, they are a very Catholic community. Yep, it'd have to be, and they know that you you keep it at a culture war level. There's two things that are playing into that. First off, I know this as well from other friends that I have from third world countries. They they all, if they can scam the government. They will because they have a hustler mentality because they're from a poor country. It's the same as when you go there and cops are just like, oh, we need to check the boot of your car. And you're just like, here's $2. And they're like, okay, okay, thank you very much. And <laughs> you just go on, you know? Yeah. Like they kind of just know that everyone's there to rip everyone off. And if they're just kind of just like, there's free money, they're going to be like, yeah, fuck yeah. They'll still work, but they'll take the handouts as well, right? <laughs> the, the, the- <laughs> Sounds pretty Aussie, actually. <laughs> Sounds like they've integrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the compo scheme. Yeah, they yeah. would be into the compo scheme, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, they love their property too. Like they, they are very much a lot of the sort of surface level values of the Liberal Party. I think they align with. They're like, you know, we want to keep our properties. We like lower taxes. We don't like too much government and we're not woke. Yes. Which is the surface level marketing of the Liberal Party. Oh, yeah. No, there's a reason that Indian and Chinese overwhelmingly vote for Liberal candidates. Um I think most Asians do, actually. But the thing is that there, there is that aspect to it. The other half of that, though, is they do have zero interest in politics. Absolutely mm. zero interest. Yeah, you, yeah. So, there's no real in. The ins into it is talking about you go to their little groups. That's what a lot of candidates do. I've- when I talk to candidates, I'm just like, what is your day-to-day life? And a lot of it is just going to the Vietnamese society. And it's not even talking about policy. It's just being there and then getting the photo. And then they're just like, he team Nash, you know, and they'll vote for that. It's it's that level. It's not that dissimilar to uh, white Australians though either. I mean, I'm sure if you just, well, well, that's what Scott Morrison does. He's like, goes to the Sharks games. I think he's not faking that. I think he actually is he's obsessed with the Sharks, but- uh, it, it, Paul Gallen in the commentary was like, yeah, that's a good politician. He's one with the people. <laughs> Man of the people. <laughs> like that's, you know. Like, yeah. Okay. Well, he was, he was in the same vicinity as you, man. Yeah. But, uh, hey, you know, if a politician came to one of my shows, it would probably make me think, ah, he seems nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not uh, completely immune to these uh, personal factors that uh, would influence our voting preferences. That's true as well. The problem is, the difference is exactly what you're saying. See, Miss actually brought my attention to this, that SBS back when his parents came in the 80s. Yeah. You watch it and it was just a lot of, 
Hello, my name is Aristos, the Greek fruit shop owner. I'm going to teach you where you can get fish in Sydney. Let's go. And then they just do a little documentary. <laughs> about it. And is this eel? They said, nice. This is the Sydney fish markets. You know, they just be. T- <laughs> <laughs> can you do that as a video? 80s SBS. Well, 80s rerun. SBS. Yeah. <laughs> SBS then, SBS now. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be beautiful? And there was that little in between period of the 90s where they were badass and showed South Park and Fat Pizza. Um, but oh, yeah, it was a good period. Now their badass version is, oh, you're transsexual? So you put a dildo up your ass and you're a prostitute. Fuck, that's brave. Like it was exactly <laughs> the stereotype of what I thought it would be. <laughs> South American transsexual prostitutes, Vice, you SBS Vice. That was what was on. What's his name? It. has a great TikTok over um, Adrian, uh, guy from Perth. Really good comedian. Check him out. Adrian Allenberg, yeah. Uh, he's, he's like how Vice come up with their stories. Yeah. He's, just, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's got a blindfold on and he's throwing a dildo <laughs> at, like a, at a white pot. <laughs> and it's like uh, it hits a uh, <laughs> prostitute, it hits uh, black, it hits trans, and it's like meet Venezuela's black trans <laughs> prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a joke. It's reality. What it Go watch. <laughs> but that's SBS now. And I was always thinking, ah, oh, this is just going to shit. This is, as I see everything through, this is a deliberate liberal conspiracy theory. I think that it actually is just a bunch of bourgeois cunts that realise that uh, no one, that they're getting free money to do whatever the fuck they want. And they don't really have to appeal to communities anymore because those communities don't watch it. They all watch, as you said, they just watch YouTube conspiracy, their version of Alex Jones or whatever. They're Mm. watching that getting broadcast from their country. They're watching YouTubers, their version of me, I suppose, or whatever like their political applications are, and they're watching things about their country. So they're not watching SBS. They don't give a shit about it. And so that's why SBS is able to just put out stuff that appeals just to the people that work in SBS, it seems. And- (laughs) <laughs> so, like, I, I was just like, there's so few opportunities to talk to those people. So, I'm guessing that it will become an extremely apolitical country. And when something is apolitical, it's really easy to mold. And that does scare me a lot. Having said that, I think that there is much worse migration than having people with an extremely hard work ethic. You know? You're not, like- yeah, you're not wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, very, uh, but you know, but it be, will be change. Where if that we're talking, people don't really understand how much of a work ethic we're talking about here. You know, you people think, oh yeah, so they make their kids study hard. No, 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 no. I went to school in Hurstville, right? There were kids when they invited parents to come, and the kids would show them their work. There were kids in tears because the parents were yelling at them in Cantonese because they didn't get a hundred percent, and there were kids having. Legitimate panic attacks. Jesus This, this is what we're talking about here. This, we're not just talking about, oh, yeah, they're a bit strict and want them to be doctors. No, 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 no. You don't understand. There's actually, <laughs> I would say there's a difference even between Indian parents and Chi- Chinese parents are notably strict. Yeah? They are. They are. Yeah, they're insane. So you would look at their parents and then think, fuck, I'm glad I'm not their kid. Well, again, I actually, I, I, the more I've thought about this, uh, because, you know, when you're a late, in your late teens and early 20s, you oh, fucking parents fucked me up. But no, I am so grateful for the upbringing I had because I feel like I got the best of Western culture and the best of Indian culture because I did not get that very strict, restrictive, collectivist Indian mentality because both my parents rebelled to a certain degree. But they were still very much, you have to study, you should go to university. They let me drop out of uni. Not not many Indian parents would let their kids drop out of uni. So uh, that's something. And my mum actually came here when she was three. Well, my my, um, maternal grandparents 
came here in 1962. So they had to, UNSW had to send a letter to the government because it was still white Australia policy. And so then they, people took photos of them because there were no other Indians. That's right. In the country. And so my mom does it. She's, because that's when you, you had to integrate. There was no Indian community then. Mm. There was one Indian grocery store um, in all of Sydney. And the uh, Prime Minister of India was visiting Australia, Indira Gandhi, and, and she, she saw my uh, grandparents and and had a conversation with them because there was no other Indians. Mm. And mm. Uh, the Indian cricket team at the time had dinner at my grandparents' mm. house because mm. a lot of them were Maharashtrian, which is the area uh, my grandparents and my and my dad is from. Uh, and then by the eighties, it had completely changed. In the space of essentially twenty years, there was a huge Indian community. That was when my dad came. And where were they at? Liverpool. No, they were always they were in the Cogra, bro. Where do you expect? Oh, really? And uh, then they moved to Hurstville, and uh, then they uh, now they're in uh, San Susie, Ramsgate area. So they've always been in St George, St George through and through. But when my uh, mum first came here, she was in the eastern suburbs. So uh, she's in Maroubra. So yeah, she she like. Just one street away from all the like uh, housing commissions in Maroubra, so uh, that place is fucked today. Let alone then. Yeah, and there were these <laughs> schools that she went to that have now closed down, and the stories she's told me are fucked. Uh, there's like a high degree of teen pregnancy, and mm. she every time she goes to the reunions, she's just like, what, the, what the fuck? No. Is this? Yeah, she doesn't. I think, Still goes. No, no, she didn't go to the last one. I think. Gave up. Um, Fair. And, Most uh, of them would be dead now. And anyway. then my auntie uh, got a scholarship to go to Skeggs, which is a very el- elite. I love that word elite when they describe private schools. It was like elite. Mm. It's like, well, okay, you paid more money. So, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's, <laughs> elite is referring to a sports person who's like notably gifted. Yes. You know, elite because there's like a castle where you go to school. <laughs> okay, so, but uh, she got a scholarship to a uh, private school and then, and then uh, yeah, became a doctor. So, uh, yeah. This is the old school version of getting into a selective school when it was just one scholarship a year. Yeah. So, a very, uh, it's just a just, typical Indian family. Um, And golden opportunity because there would have been very little competition in comparison to today. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, although I actually, my auntie is like a genius. I read, I found her books from when she was in year 11 or 12 and the notes she wrote were spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, She was extremely eloquent and clearly very well read for a, what, a 17 year old. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it could just also be that era of people were from. Yeah. <laughs> did not have yeah, yeah. calligraphy TV and <laughs> iPhones. Yeah. Um, it's true. World but, War One soldiers that died on the front line seemed like geniuses to us. Yeah, and they would have been farmers and blacksmiths, and they, and they wrote ex- <laughs> yeah. they, they wrote so poetically, poetic, pro- <laughs> just brilliantly. <laughs> and uh, now like, compare that to so that was what fifty years, so sixty years ago. So like uh, uh, quite you know more than half a century, not nothing, but. Now when in Australia plays India, in Sydney, and I'm guessing in Melbourne too, and I'm sure it's a matter of time before this happens in the other capital cities, there are more Indian fans at the ground than there are Australian fans. Oh, shit. Definitely in 2020 matches. So they're not even supporting Australia. Well, I mean, a lot of them are probably new. Okay, we have to understand cricket is the religion of India. It's cricket and then, yeah, Hinduism is like a a distant second. (laughs) But do you think that they have... (laughs) So true. So they'll just, however, they'll save up all their, you know, a lot of them here are on uh, student visas. And there's also uh, a large portion of Nepalese and Bengalis. Um, So they may not be going to the Indian cricket matches. But the ones that are on um, student visas here, temporary visas, new migrants, they don't have much money. I'm sure they're studying and at the same time they're doing 10-hour shit. They don't sleep much. They, they, they really aren't living healthy lifestyles at all. Um, and I'm sure they save up whatever money they can just to go to see, you know, a glimpse of Virat Kohli. Like that's the, that is their religion. Mm. And mm. Uh, mm. I, I just think it's a, like that's a, just a clear cultural marker of how much 
everything has changed in 60 years. I mean, I, I think my granddad had a story of when he went to one of the first, maybe the first one day match ever uh, in the 70s, was Australia versus Pakistan. And I don't know why, because he was Indian, but he was going for Pakistan. <laughs> which is, what? Dude, what are you doing, granddad? <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> You're going for the enemy. Uh, but then he stood up. Was it because uh, he felt sorry for them, yeah. or was it just because they're geographically close? I to must have just what been the hell? Uh, they out of I don't know. But uh, <laughs> he stood up when um, I forget who the bowler was. It, it, it might have been Imran Khan. Could have even been before him. But uh, he stood up when Imran Khan or one of them took a wicket, and then apparently there were just all these like. I was like, oh, yeah, mate, you wait till Dennis Lilly gets out. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently in the cricket in the 70s, um, whenever a, there was just this apparently one particular hill and whenever a, a girl would walk past, they just put up a number out of 10. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's deciding this? Was it Fuck just one it. guy with the rank? I don't, I don't know. Or was it was like a judge panel. I, don't know. I, don't, I can't imagine this. I'm pretty sure it's a pretty short amount of time for her to walk past. I don't Jeez. think they can have a council <laughs> together. <and> just... <laughs> <laughs> I hope they were lenient. God, it feels harsh just a two. If you're you never give back. anyone a two. The, the worst you give someone is like a five, pretty much. You don't really go below five. Five is brutal as well. Yeah, but you kind of go five to nine. Ten is impossible. Ten doesn't exist. It's theoretical and it's too mean to go below five. So five is mystery mark. I mean, below seven, you don't say. You're just like. Yeah, you just go, yeah. um, seven, seven. Yeah, yeah. It's seven, eight or nine, really. It's seven, eight or nine. Yeah. And nines are. Almost theoretical as well. Yeah, there's it, it, very, everyone very rarely a nine. Nah, and the reality of most be- human beings would be somewhere between most most would be somewhere between four and eight. Probably, yeah. We're looking at the real. Uh, what's that statistical measure? Let me take back, take me back to year twelve here. Whatever it is, when it's three standard deviations outside of the mean. I forget there's a name for that. I've forgotten. But um, <laughs> that's a 10. So we're talking about like 0.03% of the population. Who do you think is a 10? I mean, you can't go. I mean, Margot Robbie in in Wolf of Wall Street, I'd say was a 10. I Although think her that character would be- was a, no, a character made her a 9. But if we're just taking away the character. Came in a dare. That was a that is you'd a, get very little pushback on that, wouldn't you? And I think Eva Longoria um, in the Desperate Housewife days. That was, but 10. that's a personal. That's a bit of a personal uh, thing. And Megan Fox in Transformers. I mean, you can't go past that. That's a that. You, where do you fault her? No, you can't. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, ten doesn't necessarily mean you're attracted to them at all, does it? It's just a. All of those examples, you're like, yeah, no, they objectively are a 10. You, you can't fault it, you know. Can't fault it. Yeah. What about this one? Jessica Alba. Yeah, yeah. Because it's really In weird honey. looking at her now as a 45-year-old woman and she's, if anything, hotter. <laughs> yeah. I and that's what I'm now, looking forward but... to with all the migration, by the way. <laughs> a lot of Jessica oh, Albers. Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, dude. Put- I'm telling you, that whole Stan region here, because it was on the Silk Road and you had <laughs> trade between Europe and China and the Middle East constantly pushing there and, like, fucking raiding the camels. It was all of them now just really hot. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> because they were raiding the camels, somehow that results in. Well, yeah, there's a lot of rape that goes with that. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that like- wouldn't cause that would be bad genes, wouldn't it? <laughs> what? Why? Wouldn't you? Th- wouldn't you think when there's more female s- uh, sexual selection, that would create more beautiful people? Huh? Because like men- like then it's just biggest wins. So you don't have to be a. Go- you don't have to be pretty. You just have to be the biggest cunt with an axe. Yeah. And you would spread your genes the most. Whereas if- Yeah, but your genes are more diverse. That's why you're getting the hotness, because you're getting that melting pot of Arabs, Europeans, and Asians. 
How diverse are we? When there's warlords, no, there's no diversity in genes. And there's one guy who there's like a Genghis Khan every couple of every territory. Yeah, but he hitting chicks in all those territories, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but like it's the same guy who's usually. It's probably not the most handsome guy. It's just the most the, the most pathological narcissist yes, killer. <laughs> that's true, but it's better than. Can you imagine? I was thinking about this. Can you imagine how unattractive people would have been in the Middle Ages? Oh, I think I can imagine, but uh, I don't think I want to see it. You don't want to see it, do you? No. Genetic diversity. First of all, everyone would be filthy, but the genetic diversity would be teeny. He's got a Tasmania, huh? huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bada bing. Come to my show. Even, okay, yeah, you could do. <laughs> <That's>, oh. <laughs> well, it's sold it for me. <laughs> I mean, there's more of that. No wonder this guy's gone on a national tour. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's filthy, isn't it? Oh, yuck. You just hear the noises. The people who aren't watching on YouTube. <laughs> I hate that sound. I don't know why. <laughs> I hate doing it. Anyway. Stop doing it then. <laughs> it's it's grotesquely sexual. <laughs> that's, that's why it's filthy. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it has turned anyone on ever in the history of sex. Oh, fuck. You know what? No. 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 Even all those tens, if they did that, nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, but for the joke, no. <laughs> yeah, for okay. the joke, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, people say, uh, well, in America, they say the hottest race is mixed race. Yeah, of course. Which is what everyone's going to be soon enough. Unless everyone stays in uh, their little, uh, you know, maintains their cultural links to such a degree that they only breed within their culture as well. But it just won't happen because you'll be going to school. And this is the thing that you yeah, notice with a lot of those uh, first generations. My friends that are first gener have first generation parents, they all say, you are just marrying Pakistani, or you are just marrying you are you are just marrying Chinese. But then they go to school, and then they meet someone that they like, and then they instantly fold. I'm sure there's going to be some yeah. that are going to be really strict. True, but most of the time they kind of just let it slide. I don't know why, but that's how it is. Well, what's the 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 not even the joke? Asian men are always say uh, talking about how Asian women don't want to date Asian men. Well. Yeah, I think that that is kind of true. Because it's it, the same. People as, like you were taking them all, hey? Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> Whites are taking all the Asian women, <laughs> and and blacks are taking all the white women. <laughs> it's a chain. <laughs> it is. Oh, you're not wrong. It's not yeah, wrong, it's, is it? It's, yeah. it's, it's weird to see it the other way around. Every time yeah. you see an Asian guy with a white chick, you, I saw one the other day. I saw a Korean man with. I'm calling it now. A 10. She was a 10 for a mum. A 10 for a mum. And all you could think the whole time is, what company do you own in South Korea? Fucking <laughs> 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 <Okay>, hell. <laughs> Where does that come from, man? Asian guys, very hardworking, very successful. You know what it is? I, I think because uh, a lot of these Asian cultures – particularly uh, the, the, those, the East Asian ones, they're just not, they don't have that culture of, I suppose, uh, pursuing and seducing in the same way. And then even India had a, uh, an arrange, had arranged marriages for so long, so it's not embedded in the culture to, because traditionally men would have been... Uh, Expecting it. Sort of teaching their sons to be able to pursue women as well mm. and, and just embedding little behavioural codes within them. Mm. To ensure that they'll be able to, uh, not you know, not be predators and hunt a woman, but be confident enough at the bar to go up to a woman and say, "Hey, you know, I like you. Would you? Can I buy you a drink?" Although no, no way one less does that socializing. Nowadays. Yeah, way less parties in high school where you get all of your little awkward interactions out of the way because you're studying all the time. Oh yes, very socially awkward. It's interesting. Uh, the lo a lot of the second generation ones here then totally rebel when they leave high school when i say rebel they 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 drink a lot they often are very promiscuous and i think they hide that from their parents and mm -hmm. uh they actually have a lot of issues it's not a good parenting strategy it's uh it's good 
for your kids to enter the managerial class. They become great at, uh, you know, mid-level corporate jobs. But then after that, it's it's harder for them to then climb the corporate ladder, I think, because they maybe lack the social skills or the, God, I sound like a fucking white parent not wanting to put their kid into a selective school. They don't, they don't learn any social skills there. But there's some truth to that. If you're mm. just studying, you know, eight hours a day without learning any social interaction and just navigating that environment, that's not going to serve you well Uh in the future, having said that, how much more socialising is going to be required in another 10 to 20 years? What do you mean? Well, I mean, everything's going to be digital and, you know, everyone's got anxiety already. So, <laughs> no one's socialising anyway. I thinking about that. It's horrible, it's, isn't it? <laughs> everyone's just going to stay at home and watching whatever the fuck they want to watch and... But there is the type of person that is completely out of the sphere. And those people are tradies. Tradies have it right. I know that we're always bigging up. The, they really you are love tradies, man. Anzac, you, aren't they? You, Neil and Al's Anzac is a brickie. Well, you, maybe you, but I, I don't know. About, I wouldn't call Come them on, my you're Anzac. You're always saying I would like to do a blue collar job maybe yes. once a week. Yes, that's true. But I don't know if I'd call them my Anzac. I'm not going to wake <laughs> up at fucking 5 a.m. to salute the brickie, all right? I don't <laughs> I respect them a lot, man. <laughs> They're great guys. Probably better heroes. It's, it's an honest living and it's it's quite safe for the next generation. Uh, whereas a lot of uh, white collar jobs uh, are and, far yeah. more insecure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, ironically enough, I think the arts, well, most jobs in the arts are already insecure. It's not going to become any more insecure. Uh, and uh, trades uh, are going to be uh, safe from AI for at least the next 20 years, I think. And uh, there's probably going to be a huge demand for that sort of a work for that sort of work, and um, you earn a good living, and you can work for yourself, and you know if you're okay with waking up at whatever the fuck it is, five a.m., go for it. But no, I'm not. They're not my Anzac, bro. That's uh, don't think I'm gonna go that far. <laughs> okay. <Are they? laughs> Gotta just roped you along for that ride. Yeah, yeah. You'd probably. Come on, we've had this before where we just say they have they have figured out life. They're the closest thing that Australia has to Buddhist monks. They're the most content. They're the least socially anxious. Yeah, they're the least socially anxious. Yes, they but always they the have content? a wife with a tramp stamp on. Uh, and that's got to be fun in bed, you know, and. Kids fairly early, like They're if useful. you're 26 and you're not married and already have two kids and a house, you'd be an alco. That'd be the only way out as a tradie. Otherwise, you've got all of the basic building blocks of life handled. Sure the 70s ones. It, anyway. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Most of them can multitask. <laughs> and yeah. most of the time, whenever I'm speaking to a tradie, I feel like a lot of other white collar jobs. There's two types of guys in it. There's just either extremely beta white collar guys, or there's the guys that are trying to be very alpha the and always just been like, you, you snort coke all the time, man. Yeah, do you lift? How much can you lift? They're, or they're always just trying to prove their manliness too much. Right. Whereas every time you talk to a tradie, <laughs> like they're just me. like, how did you lift? They the tradie never does that, do they? Like, because they're not insecure. Yeah, they wouldn't be insecure about being. Perceived as not masculine because their whole job is lifting and building shit. Yeah, and they're not they're not insecure about being a man, and they're not trying to prove that they're a man. Yeah, because they are a man. Yeah, you know what? That's uh, <laughs> good. Okay, I definitely agree with that observation. Yeah, yeah, I could probably use a bit of that. <laughs> they kind of are like we're just, you know, it's really difficult to be. It's really difficult to be a man unless you're a soldier and not even a soldier that just kind of is like, the army reserve, you shoot a target from 50 kilometres away. I'm talking 
soldier with the spear in the hand at the tower, you know, that has to fend off fucking sieges every now and then. Like, uh-huh. that guy or tradie, other than that, really, like, yeah, what's the if, most if you think about profession? it, like, okay, an emperor would be a sick job. Yeah, but, but you're they're, not- they're, you can always just imagine them being little man children that throw tantrums and shit. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, guys in the arts are either the same as what you said about the corporate thing, I think. Either very, not beta, but uh, they're just very, actually they will uh, display their effeminate nature as a badge of honour and say, you know, yeah, I'm I'm not a usual man, you know, I'm I'm sensitive and I paint my nails and I do this and... That's all well and good, but then when it becomes like a, I don't think I'm insecure about, you know, when people say fragile masculinity, I don't think I have that because I don't give a fuck if people are like, you go small dick or you're short or whatever. What I am insecure about is like, oh, you're a meathead. Fuck off. Like, I hate that. I hate that stereotype so much. Do you get that? Well, no, but I just don't like <laughs> but the fact you don't that want other to people be get that. it. <laughs> uh, other people. <laughs> no right. one ever says that to me, but I just. Uh, so, I, you know what? I'm like insecure about my inter- my intellect. I think that's what I am. <laughs> which is, means I value it, which is probably a good thing. Yes. But now I'm just trying to think of. Maybe it's just I don't hang around them enough. I'm sure every human being on earth is insecure, but I can't imagine you saying to a tradie, uh, you're a meathead. They'd probably be like, yeah, 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 probably right. You'd be like, you're an idiot. Well, I didn't graduate school, so probably. Like, I can't yeah. really imagine getting to them. There's got to be something. Nah, you you drive a shit car. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Just, it'll probably be little things, like pestering them about some little shit. Mm. And eventually lose it. Mm, mm. A lot of them do have anger issues, man. Right. It, but that's the whole thing is you kind of just shirt fronting at that point. What are you insecure you about? Go? So, when people say you're lying. I hate it when people say I'm lying. Well, that's the same as me. It's, an inter- it's not because it, to me, when I hear that, it's like, oh, you're questioning like the- how finely I looked over something and how much I maybe have researched something or how much I've thought about something. That's what I hear when I hear either you're lying or like some sort of insult related to that. That's the way to get to me. If people are like, oh, yeah, you know, you're short or you're Indian or what, you, you know what? Even if people are like, you're not even funny, I don't. I'm like, yeah, I'm, yeah I don't care. Mm. Mm. Which is funny because that's my job. <laughs> but it is really weird, actually. I don't, I don't care. know that many. No, actually, you know what I do know? This is the whole thing. Because immediately in your head, in your head, you're just like, okay, I sold out the end more many, many times. So. Yes, I'm not trying to prove anything. You're any- not trying to prove anything. Yeah, you know what? I'm clearly trying to prove what I've been trying to do for the last two or three. Since I started this podcast, actually. So, I guess that's the. When you're trying to, when you're, when you're working on something and you're trying to prove something, that's when you're probably insecure about it. Like if you had, if you had insulted me when I was in my late teens, early twenties, oh, you don't get chicks. So like, fuck off, man, or two, fuck you. <laughs> 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 Whereas now it's like, yeah, whatever, fuck. <laughs> don't care. <laughs> what actually gets at me? Not much. I'll tell you what does after a while, but this is just human beings in general. But just a general negative attitude. If you're just constantly around people that are like, this sucks, that sucks, you suck, everything's gay, you you are a retard, constantly, <laughs> you snap. Is, but you that's hanging out different. with 12-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. Everything's well. gay. <laughs> what? Hey, here's this uh, close to reality. Uh, 15 minute expose I've done on a liberal politician. Oh, no, that's gay, bro. <laughs> 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 yeah, this is uh, only a retard would like this, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that's I don't think that's an insecurity. I think that's just not being around people that are cunts. I think that's the difference. So I'm just trying to think of anything else that gets at you. But it's those things because you can't really ever 
prove that you're intelligent. It's kind of just an infinite game, unless, of course, you've got your little Mensa Institute acceptance or something. Yeah. But the thing is, you, you never have your little award that says, I'm smart, unless you're in a really, really teeny percentile of people. No, really, it's dependent on how the group perceives you more than anything. But I suppose there's nothing I, I'm not insecure about being insecure about that, if that makes sense, because there was definitely a time where I was insecure about my comedy a lot because I was trying to, sh I really wanted to, I valued it. I wanted to be a, a, a successful, well-known, uh, reasonably uh, well-regarded by the critics comedian. Mm. And then I basically got there and then I stopped really caring. It's not that I don't care, but it's a sort of, it's a, it's something that I, uh, it's, uh, it's my main job, obviously, and I love it, but it's not something I'm really like desperate to prove. I mean, I'm, I'm a big comedian, you know, I don't need to prove anything anymore. But for that, for the, for a, a long period of time, when I was trying to prove something, I was insecure about it and that you then direct a lot of energy towards it and it, and it paid off and it worked. So I don't, I'm not. <laughs> if that makes True. sense, I'm not insecure about feeling insecure about my intellect right now. Because I think if if the other things, when I was insecure about something else, I worked on it a lot to the point where I as I didn't, I wasn't, I became comfortable with it, and usually quite good at it. Mm. So then, if that pattern continues, hopefully by the time I'm forty, I I don't know what I'll be insecure about then. Probably some, I don't know. Oh, my house isn't as big as my neighbours. Yes, that's what I think happens. Yeah. After a while, materialism catches up. Yeah. Because uh, any boomers that I speak to that have accomplished really interesting things in their life, they all do the same thing. They're always talking about how they don't have enough money. But you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, like, I don't know. You own a fucking house in Balmain. Then again, I suppose when they were young, it cost and like a 30 bucks. Hobby farm and probably another investment property. But they are comparing themselves. Say, for Hang instance, if you're a lawyer, you're comparing yourself to other lawyers that went into corporate law or something and they have their nice little corner office in yes. the city with the view. Yeah, it depends who you hang around because, uh, you know, if I. If we hang around Isaac too much, we'd be insecure about how much we earn too. Because that man makes bank, as we found out. On oh, yes. Podcast. <laughs> Enterprising but, young man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but uh, if we hang around, I guess, just, you know, your average 27-year-old, I wouldn't be insecure about what I am. It's about- <laughs> no. not, that, not that sounded like a brag, but no, it's not. But, you know, fuck. Ugh. All right. I take that back. But- uh, Look, the point is uh, your environment would definitely influence uh, what you feel insecure about, your surroundings. Because all the billionaires- it, it is horrible that that becomes the real sucker, and I think it does, the older you get. The billionaires are all competing with each other to become the first trillionaire. They don't, you know, they got so much money, but they're only hanging out with other billionaires- and when you're in uh, our industry as well, when especially if you're just a sort of influencer type person, uh, you're only hanging out with other influencers who are saying things like, oh, I got this deal and this is how many followers I got. And then you can't help it. It's human nature. You get a bit jealous. And, uh, you know, I'm sure if you work in finance or something, when everyone sh shows their bonuses and their pay packets, you, you – this isn't some, like, grand truth. It's just pretty – I'm sure everyone, you know, experiences this based on their environment. I guess you're a very unique case. There's not really, because you're competing with comedians online, but you're also kind of competing with media personalities like even, even your Ray Hadley's and ABC and just journalists and things. So... You've just, got these two very separate. They're both media related, but I'm just trying to think what really ticks me. I hate it. I hate it when journalists write anything about me. But I don't think that that comes from a place of insecurity. I think that comes from a place of, but you suck. It's it's actually 
more of an ego thing of like, how dare you judge? You can't judge me. That's yeah. what I fucking hate. But I don't think it comes from an insecurity place of I feel inadequate to them. Because who the fuck are they? No one knows who they are. If you psychologically dig deep enough, there's probably some sort of you can sure you can draw a line to some childhood or adolescent insecurity. There well, somewhere. there is that actually as a kid because I had no money, so it always shits me when I see that somebody got a free ride in life and you, you, you know, know that they're that. untalented yes. and they got their position because they went to the right school. That always like fucking ticks me off. Okay, I'm and with like, you there. that person looking down on you. That makes me angry. Okay, I'm absolutely with you there. Not for me, it's not necessarily the money thing, but it's when I uh, see people who I, I, I look. I don't know their day to day life, but when I feel like they've been gifted a position or a a head start, and they haven't worked for it and they haven't had to earn it, when you know I've come from a background coming full circle, I guess that has really valued education and put a high premium on on studying and and being strict and hardworking in that regard that pisses me like nepotism and connections that sort of shit mm. really pisses me mm. off mm. actually provisor what about this the person in that position is grateful to be in that position no then i i don't yeah i'd probably be a bit annoyed but it wouldn't Really get under my skin. Yeah, no, it's the person that's deluded and is like, I got this because I'm amazing and I've never actually had to challenge myself at all, but I'm here and it must be because I'm awesome. That person gives me the shit. And what you deluded. said when they then look down on on you, that that, that is- Infuriating. Yes. That's infuriating. Yes. Well, I think that's a good time to wrap this one up. Go. Fair. A little bit of a therapy session at the end. Yeah. As I'm sure everyone would always appreciate. Um, let us know your thoughts about the uh, future cultural makeup of Australia that, uh, according to uh, actually a personal source, is going to be uh, a plural plural uh, plurality of Eurasians by 2050. Uh, how do you think that will impact the country? Uh, like I said, show in Melbourne next week, shows in Sydney every week, show in Newcastle March 20th. Check out Jordan's website for his shows. neilkohacker.com slash podcast if you want to ask a question, um, send in a shout out, a topic, all the money goes to charity. Crushorganics.com, crush with a K, use the code Neil, 40% off. See you next time. Bye.